Um, I know I always say that, but I'm always like a week ahead in my sermons. That's why I'm always like, next week's going to be amazing. It's because I just wrote it today. Um, but uh, it's going to be awesome. It, you would think it's not going to be because we're going to go through genealogy next week. But next week ties in really amazingly after going verse by verse through Revelation. It ties into Revelation, and it will blow your mind. Like, it's amazing. So definitely, especially if you were in the Book of Revelation Bible study, be there for that because you'll be like, what? And I, what I think is really cool is we started at the back, and now we're in the beginning, and it's almost like, well, we already know how it ends because we went verse by verse through it, and you're like, whoa, and you're seeing all the stuff that you might have missed if we hadn't gone through Revelation first. So that's kind of cool. I'm excited for it. So tonight we're in Genesis chapter 4. I do want to encourage you, if you are enjoying going through verse by verse through the book of Genesis, there's just so much there. I really encourage you to listen to speakers online um, going through, like, the book of Genesis. I like to see what other people are saying. And there was just so many different, like, not conflicting views, but just, I never thought of that. Well, I never thought of that, too. Well, I never thought of that, too, where you could preach on this chapter for six weeks and preach something different every week. And so I just encourage you, like, um, get out there and look. Um, one of the, uh, some of the people I like is, like, John Corson, Jack Hibbs. Um, there's a guy, Paul, that, he's my favorite guy, but I can't say his last name, Paul Labutlier. He's, uh, he's a Calvary Chapel guy, but he's, he's like, kind of older, super dry, but he just is, like, to the point. I'm like, oh, I like this guy. This guy's cool. He's my kind of preacher. So uh, I like listening to him. So get out there, listen to those guys. They're amazing. Uh, if you want those names later, I can get them to you. But just go online and research. There's so much in the book of Genesis. And I think sometimes we think it's just a story. Oh, that's a cool story. And we kind of skip over it. Or a lot of adults haven't been in the book of Genesis since children's church, you know. And so, man, there's just so much there. Next week, well, this week's going to be good, too, but next week, do not miss next week. So, all right, let's just pray real quick. Father, we thank you for today, God. We thank you for the chance to dive into your word. God, I thank you that your word is powerful and alive. And every week, it doesn't matter how long I've been preaching for, my mind is blown every week because of how awesome your word is. And so, God, I thank you for your word tonight. Just speak to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to start. Uh, we're going to um uh, before we get into chapter 4, I want to look at a verse in chapter 3 that we already covered. And it's going to be Genesis 3.15. And God is talking to the serpent because he has deceived the woman, okay? And so uh, chapter 3, verse 15, and it says, I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. So this is really kind of like the earliest prophecy in the Bible um, pointing towards Jesus. He will come and strike the head of the enemy. And so, but it talks about the offspring of the woman. And so um, the offspring of the woman is going to be uh, those who have accepted the word of God. And the offspring of Satan is going to be those who reject the word of God. And so um, remember uh, how in Revelation when we were going through the church ages, the letters to the churches and how they were to a church, but then they perfectly described an age in history, but then they were also relevant to today too. It was like amazing. It was like uh, there's a, um, a structure down in uh, Longmont when you go into the Longmont and it's just like two weird towers, but as you pass it, it all of a sudden comes together and it, look, it looks like a full circle and then you drive by it, it's two separate things, and it's kind of cool. It's kind of like it's kind of like this was God's word. You, you, you step back and you look at it, and all of a sudden they fall into place. It's like a skipping a stone on water. Like, okay, yeah, that's what it was for, but then all of a sudden it had this ripple effect that just kept going, and it's still relevant to today. And so uh, this is kind of what this is like here. And so in John 8, 44 and 45, it says, this is Jesus talking, for you are, uh, are, you are the children of your father, the devil, Man, that's, a, that's harsh, harsh. And you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. And when he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I tell you the truth, so I, when I tell you the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. 
kind of sounds like, you know, a lot of people uh, today, like, you know, it doesn't matter what facts you put out. It does, I mean, nobody cares about facts anymore. Anyone notice that? It's just kind of like, okay, what do I want the outcome to be? Okay, that's what we're going to, it doesn't matter what you say. I'm naturally not going to believe you. I've already made up my mind, okay? And so these are actually uh, G- uh, religious Jewish people. They are God's people. But Jesus says, you're the offspring of Satan. So, you know, I want to I wanna touch on this real quick, especially when we get to next week and we get to genealogy. I need you to understand that this is not like Calvinism where like, well, if you're meant to be saved, you're going to be saved. Like, no, come on. And so it doesn't matter what family you were born into. So like you might be here tonight and your family doesn't believe in God at all. That doesn't matter. Just because you were born into that family doesn't mean that now you are destined to follow that too. Like we still have a choice. You still have a choice to choose God. You still have a choice to choose Jesus. And so, um, but just the same way, just because you're born into a Christian home doesn't mean that you're just destined to go to heaven because I... My parents went to church. I'm good to go. No, you still have a choice. It's still up to you. And so um, it's not the, uh, which seed, you're either the offspring of the woman or the offspring of Satan, and which seed you are is not dependent on your family, but rather are you open to God's word. Okay, so I just want to kind of clarify that, especially when we get to next week, because you're going to be like, so my parents are terrible, and uh, does that mean, like, no, no, that's not what that means. All right, so Genesis 4, chap- verse 1. Yeah, we made it to chapter 4. We're really moving it, guys. We're really moving. All right. Now, Adam had sexual relations with his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant. Oh, that's how that works. Okay. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Oh. Mind blown right now. When he gave birth to Cain, uh, when she gave birth to Cain, she said, the, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. So with the Lord's help, and it kind of has like a, I don't know if in your Bible, mine has like an exclamation point, like, man, with the Lord's help, I made a man. And so um, it doesn't really say, I, I don't know if necessarily Cain is the firstborn child. It's possible that she's, there's a bunch of girls that she's given birth to, and all of a sudden, she wasn't even aware that she could actually give birth to a man, like, whoa, a woman has produced a man? Like, this is amazing. Like, she's, like, totally, like, mind blown. I thought I could only produce women because I'm a woman, right? Not me. I don't identify as that. Okay, that's not where we're going. And so um, so it doesn't say it's a, a her firstborn, but it is her firstborn son, okay? So that's that we do know. But it seems like it's almost like the surprise to her, like, whoa, like, this is awesome. It could be her first child, like, whoa. But, I mean, you've got animals, and they, their pregnancy cycle, I don't know what you call it, but it's a lot shorter than humans, so it's not like they didn't know, like, huh, animals are having babies, like, this is weird. So it's not like that would be a mind-blown, so I think it's more the fact that it's a man that came from a woman. She's like, what? This is crazy. So uh, a lot of scholars believe that, um, that she, that the woman Eve, that she believed that the seed that she bore was going to be the one that was prophesied about that your offspring will strike the head of the serpent. So she's like, oh, it's a man, sweet. He's finally here. We done messed up, a a Ron, but it's okay because the prophecy's been fulfilled. He's right here, the seed of the one who's going to strike the head. But we know that's not true, right? Because who is the seed that strikes the head? Jesus, right. Okay, so sorry, that's not who it is, but she thought maybe it was, and so there's a lot of scholars that believe she was excited because he's finally here yes this curse is going to be broken because man we messed up but the seed the offspring is here the seed is here so so then verse two later she gave birth to her brother and named him abel um i don't believe they're twins okay i think when it says later it means like later in time not later that day there's some people that believe they're twins. There's no reason to believe that Cain and Abel were twins. They had hundreds of years to have kids. I think they could be a couple years apart, and that's totally believable too, you know, or a hundred years apart, you know. Uh, so it says later, gave bro- uh, birth to his brother and named him Abel, and they grew up. Abel became a shepherd and while Cain cultivated the ground. So Abel is a shepherd, and Cain is a farmer, and so... Uh, I don't think that this story, or I don't, I don't think, I know, this story is not about uh, poor career choices, okay? Like when, we, when they go to offer their offering to God, it's not like, 
you know, well, uh, that's all you brought? Oh, look what he does for a job. Like, that's not what it is. Uh, in Genesis, if we jump forward to Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 4, it says, Then God blessed Noah and his sons and told them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. All the animals of the earth, all the birds of the sky, all the small animals that scurry along the ground, all the fish in the sea will look on you with fear and terror. I have placed them in your power. I have given them to you for what? For food. Sorry, Polis, but like God's word said to eat meat. So uh, I'm not going to do the meatless day. It's all barbecue, baby. Did anybody have like a meat out day? Did anybody do that? Yeah, you rebels. All right. Just as I've given you grain and vegetables, but you must never eat any meat that still has the lifeblood in it. And so up until Noah the, uh, and the flood, animals weren't really afraid of humans because humans didn't eat meat. So there was no reason to kill an animal. So I, I think uh, they were pretty like, oh, it's a human, like whatever. They're not a threat to me. But then after this day, they... <laughs> We became a threat to them because now we all of a sudden we eat, you know, some of you guys will eat anything. It's crazy. Um, so it's not a it's not about a bad career. If anything here, Cain, it, it, his his career choice, he's a farmer. He's producing all the food that they eat and Abel's career. If they're not eating the sheep, his career's kind of useless. It's like. You know, if you got to choose food or cloves, you only get one or the other. Which one do you take? Food. Yeah, some of you guys, like, I, I don't care. I'll walk around naked. I can't go without food. Like, that when, we, when we fasted, you guys were like, this is the worst thing ever. I love food, okay? For me, it was chocolate and bread. I could just live off chocolate and bread. I don't know why. It's weird. Like, bread. Just give me tons of bread. I don't know. And so, if anything, it wasn't about, oh, well, Cain had a bad career. No, his was actually better. His is producing what they need to survive. And so here in Genesis 4, now we're in verse 3. And when it came time for the harvest, Cain presented some of the crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel's gift, but did not accept Cain's gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. So it wasn't like God said, what is this, vegetables? Come on, you loser, this is a terrible gift. Like, that's not what it was. Instead, it was more of, let's, let's take a look at it here, because it says that uh, Cain presented what? Yeah, some of his crops. Yeah, I get, I get some of that. If you think about it, if we're in still in the canopy theory, right, the perfect paradise, Cain's vegetables probably blow all um, state fair grown vegetables out of the water. You know, when we were in uh, uh, Guatemala, they do um, you go to the, the market, and you buy vegetables. I mean, this is just Guatemala. This isn't like uh, God's paradise, you know, garden or anything. This is like literally just Guatemala and the carrots are like this big. And I'm like, are there giant rabbits somewhere? Like, I'm like freaking out. Like, there better not be giant rabbits. This is crazy. Well, his would, would blow that out of the water. The carrots must have been like, you know, bring one at a time, right? Like, this is like a huge, heavy thing. And if you think about it, too, I mean, how many people on the earth at this point? You know, maybe at most 50? I don't know. Like, there's not that many people at this point. So he probably has an excess of vegetables, and he just brought some and gave it to the Lord. And so then it goes on. So maybe it was last minute. And just so you guys know, all you guys that like to lead worship, um, is your worship something you threw together last minute? Oh, I just gave God some of the songs I do. Because your praise and your worship is an offering to the Lord. So I try not to lead worship because I got to preach. But like last Tuesday... I spent the entire day putting together the worship set, like the entire day. It was like ridiculous. So I was like, I don't know, it's been so long since I really led worship. I don't even know what songs I do. Like, and I'm like literally hours and hours into this. Is it something that we just throw together? Whatever it is that you give to God, is just something, oh yeah, I just 
your times just thrown together or whatever. Yeah, I had some, I had excess, I'm good. Was it out of the abundance? You know, we don't really know what the issue was with Cain's gift, but was it out of the abundance? It didn't really matter, I just have so much. Think about it, there's like 50 people, they probably had, like threw away half their food because they just had so much of it. Oh, yeah, I just took off some of it, you know, whatever. Just out of the abundance. When we, when we give to the Lord, well, first of all, you're only a giver when you have excess. But do you give to the Lord even when you don't have? Or do you, is it no big deal when you give because you don't even notice it's gone because you have so much? Okay, nobody likes that. We'll move on. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get small crop, but the one who plants generously will get generous crops. You must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. So we don't know what was going on. We don't know if it was just a, out of, we don't know if it just wasn't a very generous gift. It was kind of like last minute, thrown together, out of his abundance. We don't really know. But what we do know is what Abel gave. And it says here that Abel gave the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. So, point number one, Abel gave the best of what he had. You know, are we giving God the best of what we have? Is there any effort whatsoever put forth when you do something for God? Are you, well, I'm just good at it, so I just show up and do this, you know, I just, you know. Oh, you actually like, man, I worked hard. When I was in, um, I, I lived in North Carolina, and, and uh, I used to play guitar for this mega church, and I'd play lead guitar. I'm a terrible lead guitar. Gabe will tell you, I'm a terrible lead guitar player. And there was this guy that was like Pat Johnson, like, Times a hundred. Like this guy had been, he was like as old as old, been playing guitar forever, like old rocker, and just like, like just play all day, right? And I beat him out of the first spot playing guitar because I would go home and I would spend hours practicing the lead they told me to play. And they would show up and he wouldn't know the lead, but he could play guitar all day. So eventually I was like the lead, the number one spot in lead guitar, and I am a terrible guitar player. But I was like, no, if I'm going to play for the Lord, I'm putting some effort into this, and I would spend some time on it. And so uh, are we giving God our best? Now, just so you guys know, with Abel, this would be, there's a huge risk involved in this, of what he did. Because if you give away all the best of the firstborn, then you either have to trust God that those same sheep will produce just as good next year, or the not so good ones will produce what the good ones would have produced, but I kept the not so good ones, so now my next set of sheep aren't that great, so you need to believe God that they're going to be good. There's a huge risk involved here. He gave God all the best ones of the firstborn, like, okay, they're all, these are all the best ones. You can have those, God. I'll keep the other ones. Man, that's crazy. And Abel... You know, this is what he did. And actually in Hebrews 11, 4, this is what Abel is known for. It says, it was by faith that Abel brought more, a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. It is impossible to please God without faith. So this right here, we can see his gift is like, okay, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give you this, and I'm going to trust you in this. And so there's this, this is where, you know, this last year, last year, lost my job in the oil field. Well, that's kind of huge, but we kept tithing. Now, obviously, a tithe is less. I don't make any money, but we kept tithing. And what's funny is, is when the squeeze comes, it's when it does get difficult to tithe because you're like ooh, all of a sudden 10 percent is <laughs> seems bigger than when you make more like 10 percent is like whatever i have enough to survive the month and it's just tight squeeze but the craziest part was this we get into a house based on the income of working in the oil field i lose my job and i'm on unemployment yet i never have to move out of my house 
can't explain it. I have no idea how the bills were paid. Then I go into ministry and make $65,000 less a year. I don't have to move out of my house. It makes no sense. I have no clue. But what I will tell you is this. Me and my wife never stopped tithing, no matter how hard the squeeze hit. And now I'm like, I think I'm good in this house. I mean, we're good. Like, I know it doesn't look right on paper, but we're good. I'm not even going to worry about it. And so this is where Abel is like, okay, I'm, I'm going to step out in faith. I'm going to do this. So number two, Abel gave in faith, not out of his abundance. So what makes it an offering? That has to do with the heart of the person offering it. And so, and we're in verse 6 of chapter 4. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain? Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, okay, you ready for it? Here we go. Then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door. Ooh, I love that. Eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. So Cain had a choice. God's like, okay, do the right thing, man. Just do the right thing. But if you refuse and you reject my words, sin is crouching at the door, ready to control you. And so offspring of woman is those who accept the word. The offspring of Satan is those who reject it. Those who reject God's word are controlled by sin, and I feel like that's a pretty fair statement. They're controlled by sin. They don't, they don't accept God's word. I can do whatever I want. Or those who change God's word to fit their life are controlled by sin. Yeah, but it's not the social. That's not social norms. Anymore. Then you're controlled by sin. So, So it's not, it's not the family you're born into. It's the choice that you choose to make. In Ezekiel 33, 11, it says, As surely as I live, says the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of, the, of wicked people. I only want them to turn from their wicked ways so they can live. Turn, exclamation point, Mark. Turn for, from your wicked ways, O people of Israel. Why should you die? It's a plea from God. Like, come on, people. Like, please, just do the right thing. Like, come on, just do it. And so, you know, we have people say all the time, well, why would God let people go to hell? He's literally pleading, like, come on, do the right thing. So John 3, 16, for, for, uh, this is how God loved the world. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. It's a plea from God, choose me. Do the right thing. Come on. You can do this. I sent my son to die for you. Come on. It's a plea. So we don't exactly know what the problem was with the offering, but we do know that Cain does not receive correction well. So we're going to talk about this in small groups. How well do you receive correction? Point number three, Cain didn't allow God's word to correct his life. He rejected obedience to what God had asked him to do. See, do we allow God's word to change our lives? Do we reject God's word? Do we justify sin or change God's word to fit our lives and offer God just whatever we have? You know, the, um, the, the songs we sing, like, you know, all of our praise. Yeah, I, I'm going to reject everything, but you can have our praise. There it is. Here's what I got. It's garbage, but you can have it. And so James 1, 19 says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce righteousness God desires. So Cain gets upset. He gets angry because he was corrected. And then everyone in here like, like, you don't have to admit to it. People all the time, you correct them, and they just get mad. You know, even if they, if you were totally right in correcting them, they get mad. People don't want to be told they're wrong. And so 
he's not found righteous or in right standing with God. And so James, it goes on in James verse uh, chapter 1, verse 21 through 25. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts. Hmm. You've got to accept God's word. You have to humbly accept it. To say, I know better than God is not a humbly accepting God's word. And it goes on and says, uh, for it has the power to save your souls. Don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey it, it's like glancing at your face in the mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you've heard, then God will bless you for doing it. I don't know if this is one of your fill in the blanks or not, but accept, uh, accept God's word. Or wait, accepting is supposed to be accepting. Oh, accept God's word and obey it. I want to challenge you in this because you have to, ex like, this obedience brings blessing. And so Cain didn't do this. He didn't accept correction and obey. And if we back up in James, it says, remember, when you are being tempted, don't say God is tempting you. God never tempted, is, is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from who? Your own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. It is inability to obey that turns into sinful actions. Our inability to just do what is right begins to grow and, and just produce more and more. And then before you know it, you're doing things you never wanted to do. And it all started with your inability to just obey. Think about it when you guys were in high school. You, you guys saw it all the time. It starts with like the things your parents told you not to do. And you did it anyway. And before you knew it, your life was spiraling out of control because just out of one thing, your inability just to obey. And so John, 1 John 3 says, we must not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil and his brother had been doing what is righteous. So why did he murder him? Because his actions were evil, yet his brothers were righteous. And so there's always going to be this conflict. The, com the offspring of woman and the offspring of Satan will always be at war. Always. They will always conflict. Right now, the craziest part that I've seen is, March Man any March Madness fans in here? So everybody can't wait for the Cinderella story. Does anybody notice, not know what a Cinderella story is here? Okay. Cinderella story to be like a really low seed that just keeps winning and they're not supposed to be winning and they just keep going and everyone starts going crazy like what if they actually won this would be amazing and every year there's a team like that well this year it's Oral Roberts University and if you've never been to Oral Roberts University that is a spirit-filled charismatic bible school like bible college and uh for to give you an idea of what kind of school that is they actually accepted my credits from Rama if I wanted to go there. No other school would even accept the credits from Rama. But they're like, oh, you went to Rama, you can start this far into school because we already know that you're spirit filled and you have a, a, a deep teaching of the word. And so USA Today posted a thing that said they are bigots and teaching um, uh, archaic. Um, belief system of anti-gay and transgender. We should protest their their games. We should um, riot at their games. Like, don't support them. They're not the Cinderella team. This is USA Today. See, the offspring of Satan will always be because those that are in right standing with God will always upset those that are not. And so Jew, uh, Jews and Christians are the most persecuted religions in the world. Now, we're not talking about prejudice, okay? There's a lot of prejudice in America, but I'm talking about persecution. There are 20-plus countries that openly murder Christians right now. 
Why? Because the seed of Satan will always be at war with the, uh, with the offspring of the woman. When I was in Myanmar, we had to stay away from uh, northern India because there was a bounty out for missionaries' heads. And so they basically said, if you are white, don't go anywhere near there because they don't ask if you're a missionary. They'll just cut your head off and take it in for money. You know, um, and so uh, Israel has been at attack from all sides for generations. It's not about a piece of land, just so you know. And if Israel said, you know what? We will pick up our postage stamp. You can have that spot. We'll move over here. They would still be fighting because it's not about the piece of land. It's about wiping them off the planet. This is why the Bible says that a nation who uh, supports Israel will always, always be blessed. So it's always going to be, there's always going to be this, this fight. So verse 8, one day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the fields, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Afterwards, the Lord asked Cain, where's your brother? Where's Abel? See, God gives him a chance to confess what he did. Hey, wh where's your brother at? And his response is, and, uh, I don't know. Cain responded, am I my brother's guardian? But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground from which you uh, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you, no matter how hard you work. For now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. So I have a spelling mistake in the fill in the blanks if you have it, but it's not only. Not only will you work hard like Adam's punishment, but you will never have good crops again. Oof. See, Adam's punishment, right, for sinning was, you're going to work hard now. It was super easy. It just kind of was like fun. Everything grew. Now you're going to have to work for it. And so Cain's punishment was like, you know what? You're not just going to work hard. You're just going to never have good crops again. So if you want to want, know why, like, your, the carrots aren't, like, this big for us, you can blame Cain for that. You're never going to have these good crops ever again. And so uh, I think of my farming skills. Like Cain went from like that to uh, I, I attempted to grow vegetables, and it was a train wreck. I had zucchinis and uh, zucchinis. <laughs> Everything else died. It didn't even come close to growing. Like That's why I imagine it being like for Cain, like, are you kidding me? Nothing grew. Like I just imagine like it just being this nightmare. Like I thought it was going to be fun. It's not fun. Growing vegetables is not fun. I'm just letting you know, like, I'll stick to, like, hay or something where, like, you plant the seeds and you just let it grow. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to have to sit there and do something to this. Like, this is a nightmare, right? And so, I don't know. Maybe hay is just as hard. Is it just as hard? Oh, it is. Okay. Then I won't do hay then either. I'll do, I don't know. The, the grass in my front yard that I have to cut 400 times, no matter how hard I try to kill it, it still lives, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All zucchini. I will be. Zucchini farmer, I'm a master at zucchini. <laughs> so verse 13, Cain replied to the Lord, your, my punishment is too great for me to bear. You have banished me from the land and from your presence. You have made me a homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. So not only would he be removed from the presence of God like Adam was, but he would no longer have a place to go. Man. That's rough. This is not just like, okay, you're not allowed to be here. You're going to go there. There's nowhere for you. All because he refused to be obedient. And so in verse 15, it says, the Lord replied, no, I will give you a sevenfold. I will give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn everyone who might try to kill him. So Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So God, God marks him so people stay away from him, and all starts with his inability to receive correction. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today, God. We thank you for the chance to dive into your word. 
But God, I pray as we, as we get into our small groups today that you would help us to just have good conversations, God. Lord God, that you'd begin to soften our hearts to show us areas that we need to correct ourselves. Lord God, that we would not reject the truth, but we would accept the truth so that we can be blessed by you. Lord God, I thank you that you've made a way for us to get back to you. And we're so thankful for that. And so, Father, I just pray that you would just be with us in this time. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. We're going to go to small groups. If I could have the girl.